I have uh, um, been preaching a series on the ABCs to spiritual maturity. And I know that normally on a you know, New Year's service, the first service of the new year, I would preach a, a message about you know, new beginnings, the greatness of God for 2021, give you a cool little uh, you know, uh, theme for 2021. But in actuality, today I do not uh, plan uh, to uh, preach a, my New Year's message yet. I, I'll be doing whatever you want to, I call it, a state of church address, uh, a report of last year, and then and a proclamation for the next year. I will be doing that uh, here in a, in a couple of weeks or a few weeks. But I wanted to wait a little bit into the new year with everything that's going on, with the heavy clamp down on people attending church and and, and, and gatherings for, for many of you, you don't feel comfortable. I don't know if I'll wait, probably not going to wait that long until everybody feels comfortable, but maybe a little bit lessening uh, uh, for that message, you might say. At the same time, we kind of got off track with dealing with Christmas and even Thanksgiving, but uh, we, for a couple of weeks, did not share about the ABCs, and therefore, we got behind. And I really want to wrap this up because I do want to get into some of the things. But at the same time, the ABCs to spiritual maturity are very important. One of the big questions people ask me many times is, how do you become a strong Christian? How do you get to the place in your life where you're not blown, away, blown around by every wind of, wind of doctrine, every problem doesn't knock you, you know, uh, uh, off of uh, what you believe? But how do you, how do you get to the place where that you are in love with Jesus and you know you're in love with him and you know he's in love with you and you're walking along and you're living victorious and you're being faithful to God, and you know God's being faithful to you, and you're growing up in the Lord and understanding the Scripture more and helping others understand the Bible, how do people do that? Well, there are very basic, you might say, habits that if we'd have in our life, that I believe accomplish that. So I took and evaluated what I've seen in people's lives that have been saved for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and, and had been being good, solid Christians and, and impactful Christians. What was the, the things that were in their life that caused that to be able to happen. And so when I did, I looked at these ABCs of spiritual maturity. The A is that they, the people attend uh, church faithfully or regularly. It's important to be in God's house. God declares in his word that uh, as we see the end of time coming, we should go to church more, not less, right? Uh, we should be hanging out with other believers coming to church because lots of good things happen uh, while we are in church, and that is important. And so the ABCs of spiritual maturity uh, are important. And the A, it, it starts out with the danger. B is uh, B, uh, uh, B uh, uh, there you go, be a friend. I, I was going to say be kind, and I knew that wasn't right. But anyway, uh, be a friend to sinners. And uh, that's important that we know that we spend time with those that aren't saved. Jesus said he came to seek and to save those that were lost. His entire reason for coming to here was to give us life and life more abundantly and to see the lost saved. And so the greatest, one of the greatest things you will ever do as a Christian is to lead someone to Jesus. And you are going to have that opportunity. And we train people to do that here. We teach you to do that. And every one of you will have that opportunity to lead someone to Jesus. That one today is on their way to eternal separation from God. But when you lead them to Christ, we'll be on their way to heaven. Won't that be amazing? Amen? And so that's uh, important. Be a friend to sinners. C is connect with believers. And so it's important to have more than just sinners be friends. You need to hang out with some believers. Hang out with some Christians. Rub some shoulders with people that are positive and those kind of things. The D is daily time with God. It's imperative that you have daily time with God in your life. That you daily say, God... Uh, here I am. I want to spend time with you. I read your Bible. I think about your Bible. I meditate. I memorize the scripture. I, I want to be in, in relationship with you every day. I want to spend time with you. Have daily time with God. Daily devotions, whatever you want to call it. The E is every Christian is a volunteer or every Christian is a minister. Or if you want to say every Christian has a ministry. But the point is that all of us should be have an outflow in our life. There's something God has created you to do that only you can do. And it will bring great uh, uh, it will bring joy and it will contentment and fulfillment into your life. And one of the reasons people sometimes aren't fulfilled 
is not, they think it's because, oh, I'm so busy, I can't do what I want to do. Let me tell you something. If you can find a way to use the gift God's given to you, your talent, if you can use it for God, it will create a sense of accomplishment like you've never felt before. It truly is greater to give than to receive. How many believe that? Amen? And uh, we've seen that over this Christmas season. So, uh, and that's the, the F is focus on the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. If I was to hold up an apple today, a nice red or a nice green apple, and I was to hold it up here, and I'd ask you what it was, you guys could tell me, that's an apple. You would be able to do that. There it is. What is that? An apple. There, hey, look at that. That's an apple, right? And uh, if I was to even hold up a banana, most of you would know exactly what that was. I'd hold it up, that's a banana. The fruits of the Spirit, when people see them in the, in, the, in the excess that God intends them to be in your life, it will be obvious that there is something different about you. Your love is deeper than other people's love. Your joy is just different. How can you have joy in the midst of all of this stuff? How can you have peace in the middle of of the COVID, in the middle of the junk, in the loss of job. You know, we expected Jolene's job to go a little bit longer, but it looks like it probably is not going to. And then she even lost another 10 days that we didn't expect. When originally we left, they said she'd come back, get tested, and go back to work. But now they're saying, no, she can't do that, so she's going to get some more vacation time. She's excited. I'm not excited because I do the books. But anyway, but the point is that, no, no, the point is that God's got all that under control. Amen? It doesn't matter. The Lord has all of it under control, and I believe that. Amen? Amen. So, but the joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and, and faithfulness and, and all these self-control, all of these things are important. Many times, in, especially in a full gospel, Pentecostal type of church, people have focused over the years on what we call the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts are very important, don't get me wrong. They're very powerful. The gifts are very necessary. And uh, we need to have the gifts of the Spirit in our lives. And when you're, you're, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you can have the gifts of the Spirit flowing through you. The gifts of prophecy and, and, and the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues and the gift of healing and the, gift of, the gifts of, of giving even and miracles. These gifts will flow through your life. And those are gifts that are given to you by the Holy Spirit, but they're different than the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are that which happens naturally because of the fact that you are born again. When you become born again, a new, the Bible says, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old stuff passes away, and, and behold, all things become new in your life. The, the way you used to do things are different, now they're gone, and the new way comes into your life. And so the fruits of the Spirit are not only uh, important for others to be able to see that you are a Christian. I believe the fruits of the Spirit are important as gauges in your life. What do you mean, preacher? They're like gauges. They're kind of like you can evaluations. They can look at your life, and if you're, if you're constantly living in sadness, you're constantly living in bitterness, you're constantly living. I'm not talking about moments when bad stuff happens and, and you're sad for a little bit. I'm not, I'm not talking about even if you're dealing with things like depression and, and anxiety and stuff like that. That I know that stuff happens. I've had those things happen in my own life. And I know that that happens. But it's not God's plan for you. You are a born again, Bible believing, spirit filled Christian. And God has great plans for you. And he has joy, unspeakable joy. He has peace that passes understanding. He has all of this for you. But you have to allow it to become a part of your life. Amen? Amen. That was a mouthful. I've read a couple of times. <laughs> See, and so today I really want you to get a hold of this because people oftentimes think that I'm talking about spiritual maturity. 
How do you grow up as a Christian? How do you get to the place where your children can come to you and they know that you're a man of God? And when they come and tell you, Daddy, I got a problem. This is going on in my life. And they know they're going to get spiritual wisdom from you. They know that when you lay hands on them and pray for them in your front room, woman of God, when you lay your hands on your child, they know that the power of God flows through you. Why? Because you have the fruits of the Spirit flowing out of your life. They see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness meekness, kindness, self-control flowing out of you. They know you are, you've got something that they want. Amen? People ask, how did my parents raise kids that had all three of them become preachers? How, how does that happen? Preachers, usually a lot of the preachers' kids go wild. My parents will tell you it's because they lived a solid Christian life in front of us, in church and at home. And I endeavored to do the same, to be the same person at home as I was in church, to live the word that I preached and allow love, joy, and peace to be a part of my life and my family. Amen? Amen. Amen. You see... I believe that even in your family, with your husband, with your wife, with your children, with, they need to see the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Sometimes we gauge our spiritual maturity in our life by well, how much we uh, do uh, certain things, even things like go to church, even though I think it's important, but I don't believe it's as, as, as much of a gauge in your life as, as other things are. Some people feel that when people... Uh, uh, do the gifts of the Spirit, uh, they are more spiritual than others. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 makes it very clear. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, and we're not going to put that one up on the screen. That's not my text today. But 1 Corinthians 13, 1, I'm going to read it. If I speak of tongues of men of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and cannot fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can, that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The point of it is, is you can have all these other things. Oh, they're such a spiritual Christian. Look how good they dress. Look how well they talk. Look how much they prophesy. Look how much they do this and do that. But if you have not love, the gift of the, the fruit of love in your life, then it says you are nothing. See, we get caught up. What brings spiritual maturity into our life? Spiritual maturity. What makes spiritual maturity happen? It is through the ABCs that I've talked about. But ultimately, I want you to use today's the focus on the fruits of the Spirit as a gauge in your life of where you're at spiritually. I want you to think about it. Second thing the fruits of the Spirit does, it also allows others to know that we are believers. These things are important. So Galatians chapter 5, uh, we're going to start there today in, in my, in, in, as far as uh, uh, my text today. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16. And uh, this morning I, I uh, made the mistake and said Ephesians. And I knew it wasn't right. And I'm like, up here going, that don't sound right. I mean, I can quote this thing. And here I'm preaching out of Ephesians chapter 5, but it's Galatians chapter 5. And it was a mess, but we made it. You can watch that funny thing on Facebook if you'd like. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. It says, so I say, um, the Holy Spirit uh, guides your life. Oh, wait a minute here. Where am I at? Okay, let's read it up here. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. How many know that your sinful nature has fruit and cravings also? Amen. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are uh, directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, lustful pleasures, 
uh, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and divisions. That's a bad list, ain't it? Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone uh, living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the good news in verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And uh, do you not have verse 24? Verse 24, it reads on, and I believe is very important because I want you to listen closely. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed that passions and desires, those old man passion desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Amen? That pretty much lays it out pretty plain. I could just say, man, let's go home. And some of you are saying, let's do it. But the point is, I do want to talk a little bit about it, though, okay? If that's all right with you guys. But the thing is that this is, I oftentimes talk about the things of the flesh versus the things of the spirit. I use them a lot of times to explain to you why we do big days and big events and why we do things like, you know, play uh, deal or no deal and give away prizes. I do that because I help you understand that people that are born of the flesh, they follow the things of the flesh. They desire the things of the flesh, and they are compelled to be a part of things that compel them according to their flesh. Jesus went out, and he healed people. And people that were sick were compelled to be with him because they had fleshly things. People that are hungry, it's a fleshly thing. They were drawn to get fed by Jesus, right? People who wanted the new king in the kingdom because they were tired of being controlled by the Romans. They wanted the new king. They followed Jesus trying to make him a king. They didn't know he was going to be the king of kings. Fleshly reasons. The point is people that are fleshly are drawn and controlled by the things of the flesh. And they do things of the flesh. They do all lots of that bad list. They, they, they do things like that. They're, they're drawn by the flesh. And really, to be honest with you, they have little control over it. Because that is the flesh. That's what the flesh desires and that's what the flesh does. But then when you're born again, that's why it talks about being reborn. Born again. You're a new creation. You don't follow that old junk stuff anymore. You, it was, what does it say? It says those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed those passions and desires to the cross. Yeah. You have nailed those passions and desires to the cross. And in order for you to be driven by the, the, the anger and divisiveness and gossip and, and, and complaining and hatred, in order for you to be run, you got to go up there and you got to pull it off the cross and put it back in your life again. And, and I'm here to tell you that God says he don't want anger and frustration and hatred. And he don't want sadness and, and being down in your life. He wants you not to go over and pull it off the cross. He wants you to stay over here where you're born again. Where love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness comes out of your heart. How many want to live there? Amen? Amen. I know I do. I'll tell you what, once you live long enough... When I was young, I preached this sermon. I preached it differently. Not, not different uh, theologically. It was all the same. But it, but it wasn't the same in my spirit. Because now I know that when I live as a loving person, as a kind person, it brings a lot more joy into my life. When I live as a more giving person, when I try to make sure other people are happy and joyful and taken care of, it brings good things into my life. God wasn't trying to nail all my fun to the cross and take it away from me. God God was trying to give me a life of abundance, a life of peace, and a life of hope, and a life of a future. Amen? As you get older, you understand those things. Because all that other stuff is just fleeting, and it just goes away, and, and it, it just isn't, it isn't, it isn't fulfilling in your life. See, when the fruits of the Spirit, why do I say that we should focus on the fruits of the Spirit as a basic Part of Christianity as a basic part of becoming who God wants you to be. It's because of the fact that, that, that I want you to live the life that God intended for you to live. <clears throat> we live that life God intended. We live by allowing the fruits of the Spirit. Well, I'm going to go over them just a little bit. I know there's nine of them, so I promise not to spend too much time on each one of them. 
He says there are nine characteristics to describe the fruits of the Spirit. Here, of course, in this list in, the, in, in Galatians. And, and, of course, sometimes there are different uh, interpretations to them. And I'm not going to get into the, the foundational Greek and Hebrew too much, only on one or two of them. But because but, I think we pretty much understand them without having to do that. But the first one that is listed is love. True biblical love is a choice. Do we know that? It is a choice. It is not a feeling. It is deliberately expresses itself in, in, in loving ways toward others. The greatest love was when Jesus, for God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. That is an expression of love. Jesus given to you is an expression of love. Jesus laying down his life and dying up on the cross was an action, a description of love. No greater love can have no man have other than this, that he had laid down his life for his friends. You see, but even love, <clears throat> deep love is shown not only by laying your life down for your friends as a whole, but how about laying your life down one piece at a time? One, take out the garbage. Can I hear an amen? Amen. There you go. <laughs> Right? One mow the lawn, one time doing what they want to do without complaining. Amen. Hey, wait a minute here. Now we're getting a little thick here. Getting a little thick here. Right? Laying down your life, I oftentimes would say, yes, if somebody came in and tried to attack my family, if someone came in and tried to hurt Jolene in my home, I would not hesitate. To, 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 to protect her any way necessary, necessary, even grab my gun and take care of business. You say, you're a preacher, Pastor. Yeah, I am. But I'm here to protect my family too. Amen? Yeah. And oftentimes, say, I'd even stand and, and I've even been in situations that were so dangerous to, to, that could have saved, hurt my own life, but I put myself in danger. Why? To help others. And I've been willing to do that. But many times I ask, you as a Christian, as a husband, as a father, as a mother, uh, as a wife, uh, as a friend, are you willing to put down your life a piece at a time? It's easy to be the hero and give your life, but what about everyday stuff? Amen? See, true love is shown, and what he's trying to say here is that you, when you fall in love with Jesus and you become like Jesus, then love, a love being acts come out of you, and it's actually easier to do them. I've done things that were hard to do, I didn't want to do, and, and it's even really hard to do them with a good attitude and a good heart, amen? I've done those kind of things, but as, as you become a Christian, and, you, and you, you let the Holy Spirit even become more part of your life, and you, and you become deeper with Him, and, and you come closer to Him, you don't have to discipline or make yourself love people. You automatically love people. It's a fruit of being a Christian. If you don't love people and you have a hard time putting up with people and you have a hard time giving stuff, then that's the time to get in your prayer closet, get a hold of your Bible, read a little more, study a little more, memorize more, give your life over to God, and you will naturally begin to think like Jesus says, that he left heaven and came to this earth and died on the cross because he loves us. Amen? See, I, I really want you to understand because it's important that, that you see where you're at in your spiritual life. Love is demonstrated through what Jesus did. And love is very powerful and, and love is necessary. I, I'm so grateful to this church. We are a loving church. Uh, someone, a family, a family, they're not here today course, but a family came into our church a couple, about two months ago, and, 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 and they uh, had some great needs, and, and our church just jumped right in and wanted to take care of those needs for that family, and I'm not going to give any specifics or anything, because it may end up being on Facebook, I don't want anybody there to feel bad, but, but what I appreciated was this church just jumping in and going, well, we can give them this, and we can give them that, and we can bless them with this, and we can take care of their needs. And, and we were so wanting to take care of their needs. They didn't have uh, 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 the right kind of place to live, and they didn't have you know, the, the things they needed for the children, and, and we wanted to jump in and help them. And this church immediately, and I was so proud of our church, even though the person ended up moving, and we ended up not doing, getting to do anywhere near what we would have liked to have done for them. They ended up going away, but, but then 
in even this last Christmas season, being able to bless so many families in our church. And, and, and I had hearts, people come up and heard that we we're helping families. They come and say, we want to help. We want to do that. We want to be a part of that. We want to bless. And you know what? This church, you are a loving church and you care so much. And I am very proud of you as your pastor. Amen. Amen. And that's because that you are real Christians. Then uh, love is going to be in part joy. Uh, sometimes uh, we Christians tend to downplay the meaning of joy, uh, but really the Greek word is something that is simply pretty much un understood. It's translated. Uh, the Greek word joy uh, means gladness or delight. To have delight in your heart. It's basically the same thing that the world means when it talks about joy. I know joy or more happiness. Oh, I don't have happy. happiness is fleeting. Happiness is about what's going on. Happiness is emotional and on and on. And, on. and that's true. But, the, but the, and I understand we don't want happiness that comes and goes because I, I win the lottery. Then therefore I'm happy. How many would be happy if you won the lottery? I would. Yeah. All right. But, but the thing is that, 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 that I'm also happy. I'm happy when I, when I lose or when I, when I, something doesn't go right or I got joy. Why? Not because I'm joyful in the situation that benefits me or the situation that is, that, it, that, that brings a sense of, of, of contentment to me or something. It's not just for those reasons. I got joy because the creator of the universe says that I am blessed. The creator of the universe says I have good plans for you. I have a bright future for you. And even though things are messed up today, I do not joy in the fact that, yeah, we may miss a week or two of work or I don't have joy. You know, it ain't going to get me down. Why? Because my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And anything that happens to me, it's going to be okay. Because in the end of the day, Hey, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we're going to meet on the other side with him in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? See, that's the joy that you can have. That even though problems come and difficulties come and challenges come our way, it doesn't matter. This, this, the, the deep understanding of this is I will have gladness and delight. It's okay to rejoice. Jesus rejoiced. It's okay to rejoice. It's okay to be joyful. Let your joy come out. Even show it off sometimes to your face. How many know that's a good thing? Amen? <laughs> to show a smile. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Showing that kind of joy that even though life is messed up right now. And yes, I do have friends. And, and I have people. I, 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 the other, uh, someone has passed away even in my parents' church. From COVID, uh, they caught it and passed away. They had not been at church recently. Uh, they had not been around them. Uh, only uh, for um, they had went to they had a funeral, but but nothing at church. Those kind of things. But the point is, he passed away, and that's sad. I loved that man. He was a wonderful man and helped me out many times. But but he passed away. But you know what? I'll tell you right now. He's full of the joy of the Lord. Amen. But a lot of us have 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 had friends and family. And the sick, and it's closed down our homes and made us have to live in ways that we've never lived before. And if we're not careful, it will suck all the joy out of our life and it will cause us to live in despair. God is saying, my fruit I give to you. The life I give to you because you are born again is a life of joy. And if you hang around with those kind of people that are constantly calling joy suckers, sucking the joy out of you, amen? Anybody have any joy suckers around them? I've had some joy suckers. Just suck all the joy right out of me. You know what? It's okay. Maybe they need you, and you need to be there for them, and that's great. But look at it as ministry. Don't look at it as brotherhood that they're hanging around to encourage you, uplift you, or, or you need to be like them. You need to look at what it is. It is an opportunity to be light in their dark life. Amen? Anyway, joy, I took too long. I'll go faster on the others. Peace. Peace. The world doesn't offer much peace. The world cannot give it because the world doesn't know the one who is peace. That is Jesus. See, in the flesh, peace is not a normal thing in our life. Do you know as a fleshly person, peace is not normal? <coughs> I mean, you may not be a person that's not saved. You might be a person that's not saved and, and you don't experience peace. I mean, you don't have peace, but you don't know why you don't have peace. But but the point is that the peace is not normal for non-believers. 
They always are striving. They, they always have lack and something missing, and they're always looking for it. Because there's something missing. And so they don't have any peace. They're striving. They think that they have this one more different boyfriend, this different girlfriend, this different job, this different finances, different husband, different different this. If I learn to do this, if I experience this, if I go here, if I move there, it's no peace. If I have bigger, better, I'll be happier. No peace. Why? Because everything is all about their own fleshly desires and it causes them not to have any peace. Some of them don't have peace because they have very bad stuff going in their life. And they're constantly dwelling on it. My kids are in trouble here. My life's in trouble here. I don't ever get this. I never get the benefit of nothing. Nothing ever works out for me. That's all living in the fruit of the flesh. And if you find yourself there for a moment, that's why you got to focus on the fruits of the Spirit to be a strong Christian. Because I've been there. I've been there more times than I wanted to be there. Where I'm like, oh, what a mess. I can't believe this is happening to me. I'm such a good person. Why this happening to me? Wine, 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 wine. And i got to wake myself up and say, preacher, stop it. Huh? i got to remind myself that I am supposed to live over here in joy because my name's written in the book. I'm supposed to live over here in love and do good things to people, even that abuse me or do bad to me. I'm to live over here where peace is at. Yes, it may not be perfect in my own mind, but I trust God that God has peace for this storm. Amen? Focusing on the fruits of the Spirit will let you not reside too long over in those fleshly stuff. Patience is powerful. We're not going to preach about patience because I know nothing about it. Let's go on to the next one. <laughs> Does anyone else want to preach on patience? If you would like to, I'll give you the floor for a moment. It's not, not the preachers in the house, though. I do not. <laughs> no. The point is that patience is very important. Amen? But it is. I mean, I, and I'm getting more patient in my life. Now, as far as the small little stuff in my life, I'm not as patient about. And a lot of times about progressing forward or making advancements, I'm not very patient about. But there are some things that I become very patient in my life about. And, and in those areas, it's the areas such things as even with my children. When I was younger, I just wanted them to straighten up and act right. I want to make everything right. You know what? I could train them and teach them and I'd ground them if they didn't do it right and I'd make them do what they're supposed to do. And sometimes a little paddle on the bottom, you know what I mean? And, and, and I'd correct and make them do the things they need to do. But when they're older, it's harder because now I have no, I have nothing. I can do nothing. I mean, I'm just kind of like hanging out and watching. Anyone, anyone understand? Except for when they need money or, no, I'm cheating. But anyway, but the point is they need, you know, and then I get a phone call and that's great. It's awesome. We can help them out, right? And uh, that's a good thing. So I, I don't mind helping my kids, but you know what? The Lord has really just taught me a lot about being patient, letting the Holy Spirit work on them, letting God take care of them, letting them fight their own battles and learn to become what God wants them to do. That going through their stuff will eventually bring them to the right place with the Lord. Amen? And, and even in my own ministry and in my own calling, trying to be patient, and I got even the development of Great Life Church, and what God is doing is building His great church. This is His church. Being patient and letting stuff happen, even though you spend very much time with me, I'm not very patient about it. But the point is, I want to see more souls saved, amen? And more people discipled, and more people in, in loving each other, and seeing people that are out there that are this morning are living in anger and depression and frustration and don't know where to turn to. We want to be the light on the hill that they will know if we go there that we can, we can touch Jesus and Jesus will change our lives. And there's a loving group of people there that will wrap their arms of love around us and help them. Amen? Amen. But sometimes not as patient. So patience is important. Patience is, is important. And, and uh, uh, the fast-paced world we live in and wanting it now. And I mean, last night I, I went to get us some food because I turned down an offer. Somebody make me food. But... <laughs> And uh, 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 Susan said, come have spaghetti at our house. And I said, I ain't got time. I'm sorry. I got to run around. So I ran down real quick to get some, 
something from a drive through and that drive through line was so huge. I'm like, holy smokes, what did they do? Call and say I was going to show up here and put 20 cars in line? I have no idea. Let's make Pastor Bob unpatient. Hallelujah. And I was like, this is crazy. So then I get on my phone and get on the app and order it, get out of line, go inside and get in, go home and wave goodbye to those 20 suckers still in line. But anyway, no, I'm teasing. No, I was just like, I couldn't believe all the big line. You know what I mean? It took forever. And I called Jolene and I was hoping she'd say, oh, never mind. We won't eat tonight. But she didn't. She still wanted it, even though there are 20 cars in line. I'm like, uh, no. But uh, eventually, I got it. I learned. I got it. I'm not very patient sometimes with lines, you know? Anybody else like me here? Or you like lines? Holy cow. Like, okay, good. I'm glad to see somebody. But we need to be patient. Patience is important, and it is important to, it, it'll bring, it, it, patience is, you notice how most of these fruits of the Spirit are kind of intertwined. See, patience is a direct line to peace. Do you, do you understand? And, and so sometimes people that have a problem having peace, it's because they have a problem being patient. Or they have a problem with self-control, and then they create problems in their life. They can't even control themselves. That's part of my problem. I have, a, so I have some self-control issues with my ADHD and everything. My mind running crazy, you know what I mean? And so I have trouble with it. But, but I believe that God's Spirit... And, and me being born again, I believe that God has helped me tremendously in my life. And I have been able to have peace and self-control and uh, the fruit of the Spirit of patience. But uh, that one there, I need to pray more and memorize more Bible. But anyway. <coughs> Next, gentleness. I mean, faithfulness. I'm sorry. No, kindness. Let's see. Where am I? I'm a kindness. Kindness is important. Yep, kindness. Kindness and goodness. Kindness and goodness are very closely related. They together present the picture of one who not only possesses moral goodness, or, you know, as a goodness and integrity, but also generally, gen, uh, they generously express it. So in other words, what, what I'm trying to say here is that, that you, you can have kindness and goodness in your heart and have kindness toward people and think good things about people and think, oh, I wish that would happen for them. But when it's the fruit of the Spirit, it's, it's a whole lot more action than just thoughts or feelings. There is a generous expression of a life lived in kindness, a life lived in goodness. You sacrifice what you want so that other people can hear and feel your kindness. They see it. It's tangible. It's touchable. And that's really what God wants us to be and have. Amen? Faithfulness. Faithfulness is another uh, uh, gift or fruit, I'm sorry, fruit of the Spirit. It's to be somebody that is reliable or trustworthy. I, I, faithfulness is, is a powerful one. One of the things we have is very faithful people in this church. People that do their calling in their ministry. People who tithe, people who do a ministry work in children's or, or help with the lawns or youth or, or worship or music or... You know, it goes on and on and on. And I know, I, I can't name everything everybody does. Your prayers and your, your, your giving. It, 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 it's incredible. We have a faithful church. Faithfulness is very powerful. I, I want to be a faithful person. That's my desire. Number one, I want to be faithful to God. I want to be faithful to God. I want to hear, come in like good and faithful servant. Faithfulness was so powerful that God put it in there that that's what's going to be said when you come and enter into heaven. Come in like good and faithful servant. I think sometimes we don't think how powerful faithfulness is. Faithfulness is important to be able to be trustworthy and trusted. I want to be a, a, a man, a Christian man a, 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 that can be trusted. And I want to be faithful to God. I want to be faithful to my wife. I want to be faithful to my family. I want to be faithful to my ministry and to be in the pastor of the church. I want to be faithful to my ministry. And that stuff is produced as a natural byproduct of being close to Jesus. Being born again. Knowing him. Before you were untrustworthy, you would say one thing and do another. 
Before that, you couldn't be trusted to get anything done. But now that you're a man of God, a woman of God, that you are born again, that unfaithfulness has been nailed to the cross. And now God says you can be a faithful man or woman. Amen? Amen. Gentleness and meekness. Closely related to the word humility, humble. The problem with the... Uh, uh, the word humble is that people think of humility as, ah, I'm a worm. You can step on me if you'd like. <laughs> right? Worm am I. I'm so low. I'm so unimportant. Oh, oh, no, I don't need anything. It's all go okay. <laughs> right? No, it's not about that. In actuality, the spirit of meekness and gentleness and humility is strength. It's strength under control. It's being strong and have the ability to do something, you might say, that's harming or hurtful to others, to be in control of whatever. But your ability to understand that you are in control and you don't have to be the one that's always, the, the gets the glory, that gets the, the, the praise, the one that's always in control of everything. You can be the one that is under control and I've got strength and I have the power and the authority, but it doesn't mean I lord over people. It doesn't mean I... I, I hurt people with it. it. I want others to feel important. I want others to feel good about themselves. I want others to be able to do it. And I'm willing to submit and get out of the way to let that happen. It's not wrong to be a person that gives honor to somebody. Honor's good. And, and humility is good too in the right way. Humility is not, I'm nothing, I'm unimportant. And it's not wrong for you to give honor to honors due. God makes it very clear that we need to give honor to those who honor you. He says to give double honor to those who are in the ministry or the work of the ministry. God is okay with giving honor. There's nothing wrong with that. It's when you give honor, for instance, you give me honor sometimes. As the pastor, you honor me, you honor my wife, you honor Pastor Jean and Susan, you honor. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. But it's not for us to go and think that we're better or to get to our head. You know what I mean? Same thing is for you. To be people of gentleness and meekness. It is a gentleness or a grace of your soul. It's to be graceful about it. Anyway, it's important to gentleness and kind and meek to people. Self-control is the final one I want to talk about. The last characteristic Paul describes in the fruits of the Spirit uh, brings us back to the list of the works of the flesh. Because if you go back even into Galatians, into the previous it talks about being controlled by the things of the flesh or being controlled by the things of the, of the spirit. See, the indwelling Holy Spirit has the strength to control our selfish desires. You have the power to say no. I won't do that. I'm not going to live that way. <clears throat> I'm not going to live <clears throat> in that list in drunkenness. The Bible does talk about being drunk. Drunk is a sin. It's wrong to get drunk. Drunkenness is mentioned many times in the Bible. <laughs> be filled with the Spirit, right? Not drunk where with an excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Being drunk is mentioned in the Bible. Now, if you don't like that part, you're welcome to take your scissors and cut it out if you'd like. <laughs> but it's still in the Bible. I'm not preaching Bob Barker's word. I'm telling you it's in the Bible. You can do what you want with it. Well, that's old-fashioned. I'm, not, I'm just telling you it's in the Bible, <laughs> okay? So the point is that drunkenness is in, in there. So is a lot of other things in that list that weren't good. Anger, right? Getting angry, bitter, those kind of things. The things that Jesus nailed, wants you to nail to the cross. He's looking for us to, to do that. You have control. You can say, no, I will, not, I will not commit adultery. No. How many think we should be able to say no to adultery? Can I hear any amens out there? Amen. All right, good. Hey, I got it. Some of you are still awake. Good. The, the point is this list of this junk uh, that is there that we've nailed to the cross is what it's trying to say is you can say no to living a bitter life. You can say no to retaliation to people that have abused and hurt you. You can say no to living in unforgiveness. You can say no to living a, a life that is full of Why? Because one of the fruits of the Spirit is you have self-control. You can live in peace. These things over here bring peace and love and joy and hope and a future. And that's God's plan for your life. Amen. 
All right then. I guess that's a, that's enough. I didn't mean to end it on. I didn't mean to end it on a on a, on a, on a bad note because I'm trying to help you to understand. I hope I didn't. But I want you to know that God has great plans in store for your life. If you want to live the strong Christian that God's called you to live, the ABCs of spiritual maturity will help you do that. Attend God's house regularly so you can hear things that are in the Bible that you didn't know were there. So you can rub shoulders with other believers like it is in C, connect with other believers. Or the B, be a friend to sinners. It's important. These things are important. D, daily time with God. And E, every Christian a minister. Or F, today, focus on the, the, the fruits of the Spirit. Keep it in the front of your mind and your heart that God wants to give you love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control. God wants to give you these things. Amen? Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. Did you notice I skipped patience? <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I, I, I didn't skip it, but I just thought it would be funny to say. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. God has good things in store for you. Amen? And he has good things in store for me. How to do it. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person that's here today. And God, I just pray for your blessing upon their life. And Lord, I pray that all of us would just grow up and become all that you called us to be, Lord. Lord, I pray you would help each one of us just to become more like you every single day of our life. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, you would help each one of us also to let the old man go away. And Lord, behold the new man, the new things you have planned for us. Let your fruits of the Spirit rule and reign in our life. 